Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Today's episode is all about the U.S. Navy and its past, present, and future challenges, especially through the lens of the current conflict in the Middle East, with the Navy serving as the main means of reprisal against Houthi rebels, disrupting global shipping. And then also, of course, a lot of focus on the possible conflict in the Indo-Pacific, specifically relating to Taiwan, the United States, and China. My guest today is Dr. Jerry Hendricks. Jerry is a retired Navy captain, and he's done a lot of really impressive and really relevant writing on the future of the U.S. Navy and its current challenges. He's also written about another subject, dear to my heart, the arsenal of democracy and what needs to be done to repair the United States' industrial base. Hope you all enjoy this conversation. And because Jerry's written so much, I've included a bunch of really great links that folks should check out below in the show notes. Hope you enjoy this conversation and a huge thank you to the Foundation for American Innovation for supporting the work of this podcast. Jerry Hendricks, welcome to The Realignment. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, I'm lo really looking forward to chatting with you. You're very prolific, so I have a bunch of links to your writings and recent speeches you've given in the show notes. I want to just start here in this broad conversation about the Navy by kind of defining the moment. You wrote a great and delivered a great speech um, titled A Period of Consequences. This is back in 2022, but the whole point of a period is I think this will always still apply to 2024. So how about you just like start by introducing how you define the current moment the United States found itself in? Oh, uh, well, thank you. That's a great uh, question. And I appreciate the fact you read that speech. So I was invited to give a speech at the Metropolitan Club in Washington, D.C. in November of 2022 uh, as part of their, uh, it was close to the Navy's birthday. Uh, but I, I drew that speech from a, a speech that Winston Churchill gave in, before the parliament uh, in, the, in the years leading up to World War II, in which uh, he made the point that we are no longer in sort of a a period in which we were free to make decisions. But in fact, we were in a period where we would have to deal with the consequences of past decisions. And we're very much in one of those moments today, I believe, that we're in a period of consequences, mostly because despite that a number of voices that have been out there, uh, I knew, I know, for instance, that Andrew W. Marshall, uh, the, the legendary director of the Office of Net Assessment, was talking about a rising China as, as uh, early as the mid-1990s. Um, and in fact, there were serious voices talking about a revanchist uh, Russia in the early 2000s during the George W. Bush administration, where we began to see these clear indications going. But we continued to be somewhat strategically distracted with the two land wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and certainly the, the events of 9-11 were, were serious, and we had to take those seriously, and the, the threat of terrorism. But the fact that we sort of took our eye off the ball from a geostrategic standpoint to focus uh, sort of very intently on these two uh, land wars and, and sort of lost sight of the broader geostrategic competition that was developing, specifically the rise of China and, and also the types of investments that China was making moving beyond um, a first island chain Navy, a coastal patrol Navy towards a blue water Navy or what Russia was doing moving uh, towards a sort of a deep investment in advanced submarine uh, technologies that would allow it to potentially dominate the Atlantic basin um, and thus severing the ties between North America and the European ally uh, treaty allies. So we, we sort of missed all that. And so today we, we have arrived at this period of consequences where China is ramping up. The pressure is definitely on Taiwan. And in fact, I believe that we're we're inside the event horizon of a of a significant uh, event, geostrategic event, where China will feel that its moment is now to make a move against uh, Taiwan to recover their lost province, which of course was never a province of China. Um, you know they've they've had Tai uh, they've taken Hong Kong, uh, they've they've subdued Tibet. This is the next step. Xi Jinping has has bet his entire legacy on this. And, and I think that as they look around the world at the level of distraction and general weakness of the U.S. position in the world, specifically if we look at current events, which I'm sure we'll get more into, in the Red Sea, the Strait of uh, El Bab Mandel, uh, what's going on with Suez, that everyone sort of understands that the United States is at a, at a period of significant strategic weakness right now. So I think that we're, we're dealing with this period of consequences, and we may be facing 
a significant wartime threat. Uh, obviously, things are going sideways in the Middle East. Uh, Europe uh, with Ukraine uh, is is a greatly challenged and troubled place. And I believe that uh, that the world understands this and there'll be a move in the Asia Pacific region also within the near near future. So uh, so again, we're entering a period of consequences. And I read your 2020 book, which is to provide and maintain a Navy. And you're really focused there on the size of the Navy, the overall um, strength of the Navy. But in your recent writing, you've pointed out that 2020 work you were doing is really concerned with the Navy of 2040 and 2050. We'll get into that. But I think the key thing about a period of consequences is what we should be really focusing on, especially in this conversation, is what does this all mean for the Navy of 2024? Because if we have 30 years, all sorts of things could be done in 30 years. Very unclear to me what could be done in the period of five, six, or even weeks, if we're talking about 2024 being part of the event horizon. So I'd love for you to introduce like what 2024 means from the naval perspective. Well, you know, we got the first inkling of this um, in a public way when Admiral Phil Davidson, then the outgoing commander of the uh, Indo-Pacific Command, uh, gave his sort of valedictory testimony in front of the Congress about two and a half years ago. And Davidson talked about this window um, that of, of the China could move. And he sort of opened the window in 2024. And he says that anytime, I think it's up through 2027, that there was a high probability of China taking action just based upon a correlation of forces, uh, their relative readiness, the strength of their economy, our relative lack of readiness, the fact that their Navy was on the rise. I mean, China's People's Liberation Army Navy today is at about 375 ships, we're at about 291 ships. They are building um, a new surface combatant every six weeks. Uh, we are building, uh, on average, uh, only about six surface combatants a year right now. Uh, two Arleigh Burke class destroyers, um, two fast attack submarines. Actually, it's only about 1.3. We've had really serious industrial challenges, and so. Very much the all trends are in China's favor during this sort of window of time. But we all recognize as well that that doesn't continue forever. There was a, one scholar pointed out that China needed to become great before it became old. Because of the, the implications of the one child policy, China will face a, a significant demographic challenge as that one child will be supporting two aging parents and four aging grandparents. And so their social stability structure is going to be upside down, an inverted pyramid. That window begins to open for them in about 2029, really accelerates after 2032 when the full impact of one child policy comes to bear on them at home. And so whatever China is going to do, it needs to do now. So, so one of the things that I talked about, you know, and you're right, you know, for years I wrote about the, the need for a larger Navy. And then I went down one layer and I said, well, in, in that Navy, we need this number of frigates, this number of carriers, this number of destroyers, this number of submarines. But what I began to realize is none of that really mattered because none of that was going to manifest inside the threat window, this Davidson window uh, that, that we're seeing. And so what can we do now? What happens in inside this window? And, and so I, I began to write and focus on the industrial base uh, to, to figure out like how if, if, a, if a ship or a submarine gets damaged in war, where is the maintenance going to occur for that platform, given the fact that so much of our fleet right now is in disrepair? For instance, some 40% of the fast attack submarines in the United States Navy right now cannot get underway by the Navy's own public admission because they've lost their dive certifications because they're in arrears on required maintenance. And believe me, if there's anybody in the Navy that takes maintenance seriously, it's the nuclear powered submarine force trained by Hyman Rickover uh, over 50 years to make sure that no boat submerges that's in an unsafe condition. And so you, here we have over a third of the submarine forces sidelined. Um, we have significant material challenges with our surface force. Our Ticonderoga class cruisers are all 30 to 37 years old and they're retiring. Our Burke class destroyers, which are really some of the great destroyers in the world today, but they're rapidly aging as well. You know, DDG 51, the first Arleigh Burke was uh, commissioned in 1991 when I was a lieutenant junior grade and I've been retired from the Navy for almost 10 years now. 
So we're having real significant challenges, and uh, and we haven't even commissioned our first Constellation class frigate, our next class of ship into the Navy. We're behind on that right now by nearly a year, according to the Navy. So uh, we're, we're facing significant challenges in this near-term window. I'm taking notes here because we're going to be jumping all over the place, but I'll try to really signpost this well. So something I think would be useful for folks, um, when you're describing this these sets of challenges, what are the challenges that are money and will problems versus, no, this is a structural impediment that no matter how many acts of legislation or throwing of money at something cannot be adjudicated? Like, What's the difference between those two categories in this case? So we do have, uh, let's just call them ephemeral challenges. So, um, you know, it's been a long time since we fought a naval war. Now, I think a lot of people today would say, hey, USS Kearney and all these ships that are in the Red Sea shooting down uh, Houthi missiles right now, they, they are in a combat situation. And that is true. They are in a defensive war situation where we have invested in this technology of shooting down cruise missiles and ballistic missiles for the better part of 30 years. Um, but we have not gone mano a mano, blue water navy against blue water naval navy in a naval war setting uh, since the end of World War II. We had a couple minor skirmishes during the Vietnam War, uh, but certainly not anything where we had cruisers on cruisers, destroyers on destroyers, sort of in a in a in a slugfest. So the we we have a a reputation of being a very good, very professional navy. And, and I think that reputation is good, but it hasn't been tested in nearly 70 years. So there's a combat credibility issue, an ephemeral issue there. There's also an issue of national will. So right now, um, based upon what we've seen over the, well, let's just say the last three years, um, you know, first with the withdrawal from uh, Kabul uh, and the way that was handled, which was kind of a, a debacle, uh, to the ramp up to uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, which I think that we fumbled the ramp up, did not take the Russian threat really seriously. We've done extremely well. And I say the I gave the administration uh, you know, good grades for its response in unifying uh, Europe and the United States in our response and giving aid to the Ukrainians as they defend themselves. I think that that's rather positive. But the, the fact is, is Putin felt that he could go into Ukraine because he perceived that we were weak and that we would not respond immediately at that time. That's very much the situation that we're also seeing right now with every day that we don't push back, not against the Houthis. The Houthis are the proxy. Iran is the bad actor in the Middle East right now that's uh, supporting Hamas um, in, uh, in Gaza, um, Hezbollah uh, in southern Lebanon, and now the Houthis in Yemen. Iran is the malfactor here, and we are not hitting Iran where it hurts. And so every day that goes by that we don't really take it to them. And we, we just lost, uh, at the time that we're, we're, we're talking about this, we lost three American servicemen and we had over 30 injured uh, in Jordan uh, due to an Iranian attack. Um, and, and we, at, at, again, in, in this conversation, we haven't responded yet. Uh, and and quick, so every day- Quick, quick, yeah. quick question, because this speaks to your writing though. Part of the reason why we haven't responded is, and you, you wrote about this very eloquently when you're pointing out as a result of these consequences, as a result of like bad investment and policy decisions in the 90s and 2000s, we have lost a lot of options. And it seems to me that we do not have the option of backstopping Eastern Europe, prepping for the Indo-Pacific, and also potentially escalating the Middle East. So what's your so having written the point about tough choices, it seems that one of the tough choices we're making is we're not escalating against Iran. I'm curious what you think about that. No, I, I think that's a, a good point, but there's also a, a part of the argument in, that I made in to provide and maintain a Navy, a, as well as in the Atlantic essay, that we need to understand that the Navy is best suited in its proper context. So uh, this is an argument, by the way, that uh, my friend uh, Elbridge Colby has made with his strategy of denial argument that he's been talking about. Uh, you know, Elbridge uh, Bridge makes a comment that we, we can't be everywhere and we have to prioritize. Well, my point is, is well, the Army's natural place would be in Europe um, if the Army was there, if the Army was on the ground in the way it was in the past. You know, when I was a young man, we had a couple uh, divisions on the ground in Europe um, that were forward permanently based in Europe. 
if the army had remained in Europe, I'm not sure that, that Putin would have made the movements he made. But the fact that we have to move the army from the United States to Europe now means that we have to go across that Atlantic divide. And, and Putin has an answer for that with his new Severinsk class uh, SSGN submarines. Uh, and so there's there's significant challenge there. We, we've badly positioned ourselves. The U.S. Navy right now should be concentrated and focused on the Asia Pacific threat. That's our natural home. Uh, the big blue ocean out there where we can take on those threats, where we have the maximum amount of, of flexibility. Uh, the Middle East right now, for everyone who said, well, we needed to get out of Iraq and come home. When you leave someplace, you create a power vacuum. Um, you know, and, and the fact is, is we left, but then we said, well, I still have interest there. So I'm going to put special forces or other types of irregular forces, be it in Iraq or Jordan. Those places become uh, sensitive pressure points. Uh, and in many ways, hostages um, to the local region, something that Iran has known and has been uh, you know, trying to, to hit us at because they feel that they can give a, us a Beirut barracks-like moment if they can take out a number of Americans that maybe we would pull out in much the same way as we pulled the Marines out of Lebanon after that 1983 bombing during the Reagan administration. So everyone there has got a great sense of history, and they're trying to play to what they believe is their historic strengths, our historic weaknesses. And our historic weakness uh, has been sort of a lack of a long-term focus um, and a lack of a long-term national will. Americans tend to be very quick to anger. We have this Jacksonian impulse that if you poke us too hard, we're going to come back and hit you pretty hard at that moment. But we also tend to lose focus in about five years um, on the outside. And we all want to sort of retreat here to North America and come home. Everyone else has kind of figured that out, and they figure that they can outlast us, and in the end, they can uh, you know, sort of grind us down. Right now, the area of focus to me, the thing that I'm most worried about, because uh, Taiwan is not only a capitalist democracy and, and a large one at that, it, it's one of the world's leading suppliers of uh, semiconductors, and it's a vital part of the Western economy. And so I, th I think that we have to have a focus there, both from a moral reason as well as an economic reason. So uh, so I think that's where we need to be shifting the focus over time. I think that was a great rundown of basically the three different theaters we're talking about here. So then what are tough choices that in a 2024 context we're going to have to make? Because it seems like a tough choice, though it's baked in, is we're obviously not going to forward deploy whole divisions of the US Army to Europe. Um, what would be examples of tough choices you see us needing to make? Well, the, uh, here we are in 2024 uh, right now. So in many ways, we, we've gotten past the, the point. If, if you believe, as I believe, that something may happen uh, this summer or early fall with regard to Taiwan, we should have been husbanding our forces, increasing our readiness, uh, maximizing production of major units of ordnance, JASM, TLAM, uh, the types of things that we would need to stand on, stand in to that type of an environment. Um, and we haven't done that. Right now, the Gerald R. Ford's just come home after having been extended on deployment twice. So she's burned up eight months of readiness. It's going to take her a while to get her ready again. And that's the aircraft Eisen carrier, correct? Yeah, aircraft carrier. The aircraft carrier Dwight Eisenhower, uh, as well as the John C. Stennis and the Theodore Roosevelt are out. Uh, the Reagan was briefly out. Well, that accounts right there. That's five of the 11 American aircraft carriers. So we've been burning up their readiness. Uh, they're not always ready 100%. They have to come in. Their air wings have to be trained. The carriers have to be loaded. There has to be material maintenance done on that. As I already mentioned, um, some of our Ticonderoga-class cruisers are being retired. This year, I think we're going to retire four of them in 2024. So at this very moment, when we're coming into this sort of window of danger, um, you know, we're still seeing a decline in, in our material uh, readiness of our force. We should be right now calling the fleet home, getting them maintained, getting them ready to surge this year in response to crisis. Um, and in fact, we're not. Uh, you know, again, the submarine force, which we deem as being absolutely crucial in a response to a Chinese uh, threat against Taiwan, that submarine force, we're not seeing significant increases in its maintenance. Uh, we are about uh, a two dry docks behind in the capacity we require to maintain our submarine force, and we can't make that up in the short term. So uh, those are the places where I would like to see the Congress and the administration spend a lot of time and a lot of money is on submarine maintenance and surface ship maintenance, as well as production of ordnance. Uh, but uh, but we're not. In fact, we, we've managed to get ourselves 
bound up in a discussion about the southern border um, and that, that is tied to aid to Ukraine and Israel um, and, and Taiwan. And, and we're sort of getting wrapped up in the, the southern border uh, issue, which I, I recognize as being important with uh, uh, fentanyl and everything coming across it, et cetera. But we've tied everything together in a bundle and we've ended up sort of uh, hobbling ourselves in moving forward on the geostrategic interests of the nation. So I guess the real question here is I'd love for you to actually explain, because you actually write about this in your Atlantic piece, that um, the Navy out of all of the armed services, obviously Space Force is in its own unique category here, is pretty opaque um, to folks. So when we're throwing around frigates and corvettes and destroyers and 291 ships, could you actually just explain how the Navy works from a what are the ship types in those 291 ships? I know there are 11 aircraft carriers. Um, you know, that's a mandated number that we maintain. But what is what do these terms we're throwing around mean? Well, it's so, you know, the navies are comprised of, of different vessels that are there to do different missions. Um, so the since the Battle of Midway uh, in June of 1942, the uh, large aircraft carrier has been the centerpiece of the American Navy. The, the ability to project power and establish sea control from the deck of an aircraft carrier through the use of its air wing to interdict other ships, uh, to, uh, to sink them, to damage them, to force them to turn around and go home. Uh, that's been the, at the center of the way that our Navy operates. In fact, after World War II, we created an entire new class of, of carrier called the supercarrier. First, the USS Forrestal, uh, and then her sister ships, and then the Enterprise, and then the Nimitz classes. Those ships were all uh, created to be large enough to uh, launch very large airplanes and then recover those same airplanes on them. And that's actually a matter of physics. Uh, you have enough space to shoot one up to 120 miles an hour with a catapult and then capture it with an, capture it with an arresting gear to project power over land. We wanted to attack the Soviet Union deep into the Soviet Union from aircraft carriers at sea. So we built a whole class of carriers to do that. Uh, so and power to pause you real quick to make this um, clear to folks. So for example, if you think of a you know modern aircraft carrier, you're thinking of like F-18 Hornets. Um, but I, from your reading, you know, you're talking about like A3, what, uh, could, you, could you explain? So when you were saying strike ranges and long range, explain the significance of that <laughs> difference between back then and today. I, I, uh, the great question, and, and you've gotten into my wheelhouse here, because we don't have long-range penetrating strike on the aircraft carrier today. Uh, when we built these carriers, we built the aircraft carrier, uh, the, the, the Forrestal, to host the A3 Sky Warrior, which was a very large 80,000-pound bomber that flew from the aircraft carrier deck that could carry a nuclear weapon. It could fly 1,500 nautical miles. It could actually be extended to 2,000 nautical miles through the use of tanker aircraft to transfer fuel and drop that weapon and then return to the aircraft carrier. So you had a strike range of some 1,500 nautical miles. So you take off off the shore, you could go deep into the Soviet Union. We complemented the A3 Sky Warrior with long range uh, uh, fighters that could escort it in. We created middle range um, uh, light attack, uh, not light attack, but medium attack bombers like the A6 Intruder. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Flight of the Intruder or read that novel, that was a thing that could go a thousand miles, carry 18,000 pounds of ordnance. That got extensive use in uh, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia during those campaigns where it could fly long distances had A4 aircraft, um, uh, you know. Anyways, the whole carrier was set up with the idea of, of long-range penetrating attack. Then, after the Cold War, uh, it came time to retire those airplanes. They had just sort of used up their wing life. The design had gotten old and antiquated. We tried to integrate a new uh, replacement aircraft for the A3 and the A6. It was going to be the A12, um, and but the A-12 sort of failed in conception because there was a lot of problems with the design. It was going to be a very stealthy design. We called it the flying Dorito chip because it was like a big triangle um, that, that would fly and carry a lot of ordnance. And it, that got canceled during the Bush administration. That's the H.W. Bush administration. Not yeah, I was going to ask Bush. first or second. <laughs> yeah. So that got canceled. And what we did was we moved away from long range strike. We went to what we call light attack. So the F-18 Hornet that we fly from the decks today was a replacement for the A-4 Sky Warrior and the um, and and the uh, the F-4 Phantom, the oh. F-4 Phantom, 
And so it was a short range light attack airplane. So we designed the Hornet to replace those two planes. So when your A3 uh, retired, and then your A6 retired, and then your F-14 Tomcat, the famous Top Gun uh, from the original Top Gun, 1986, when I was young, uh, when that all retired, we lost all the range off the flight deck. We went from about a 1,000 nautical mile range for an air wing down to about 500 nautical mile range, and we also cut the amount of ordnance that we could carry. So today's carrier air wing, the really operational part of the carrier. Carriers are great, but if you don't have the right airplanes on them, the carrier can become irrelevant. And really, that's where we're on the brink of today, that when China has created a DF-21 missile that can target aircraft carriers a thousand miles out at sea, uh, if you don't have an air wing that can go greater than a thousand nautical miles, then you can never touch them. It's like, it's like going up against Muhammad Ali, uh, who had a tremendously long uh, wingspan. Uh, with his punching range, but you've only got half of his punching range. So you know you're going to get hit by Ali when you try to step in to get, you know, know, contact with the body. So this is a real problem for us today. We need to increase focus on the aircraft carrier on its air wing so we can increase that range and make the carrier relevant in the fight that we're facing in these modern anti-access air denial uh, environments. That's what we call the what China has built with their uh, anti-ship ballistic missile and their anti-ship cruise missiles and their new fighters and their new bombers. They're trying to push us off their shore. So again, to come back to your, your original question, the aircraft carrier is the centerpiece, but the air wing is the essential, crucial element to understanding whether that carrier is going to be uh, relevant in the modern fight. But that carrier, because it's so important to us, again, the centerpiece needed to be defended. So we built cruisers, Ticonderoga class cruisers that are equipped with the Aegis uh, Mark 7 weapon system. This is a spy radar system that can see hundreds of miles and track hundreds of targets, and then uh, allocate weapons to them to help defend the aircraft carrier. If anyone's going to come out and attack the aircraft carrier, whether it's a ballistic missile or a cruise missile or an airplane, the SPY-1 radars associated with the Ticonderoga-class cruiser would try and shoot it down. So the cruiser was there for air defense. Then we created the Burke-class destroyers. The Burke was sort of the ubiquitous utility infield. It could do air defense. It could do anti-surface warfare to take on other sh- Navy ships. It could also do anti-submarine warfare because it had a tremendous bow-mounted sonar. It could go out there and can ping underwater to track submarines and then could attack those using its helicopters or onboard torpedoes. And then we had frigates in the past, which were really focused on convoy escort to escort our forces to and from Europe or to our allies in, in Europe. But it would also, those uh, frigates would also do anti-submarine warfare. So we had a layered defense around the carrier to enable the carrier to project power over land. Mm-hmm. Today, we, we, I have what we call the rise of the antis. Uh, we have a lot of anti-surface, anti-air, anti-ballistic missile, anti-submarine. We have all the defense in place, but we lack the critical offensive punching arm in the Navy. And that's a real challenge that I think that we have to overcome. It's an imbalance in our force that we've allowed to happen over the last 30 years since the end of the Cold War. And correct me, so it's the F-35C that's with the Navy? Yes. So that's the um, latest well, where, where does Where does that fall, fly into your um, striking distance aspect? So the F-35 Charlie was going to be part of the Joint Strike Fighter, which was conceived in the mid-1990s And it was supposed to become a replacement for things like the A-6 Intruder. It would be able to do um, joint strike, meaning power projection and hitting other things and attacking things on the ground, as well as being a fighter. It was going to incorporate stealth technology in it to lower its radar signature so it could be uh, more effective in some of these advanced radar environments. Uh, But it was also going to have a bunch of advanced weaponry. What funny thing happens with the development of all fighters these days is we originally projected that we wanted the Joint Strike Fighter to be able to reach out to about 800 and 900 nautical miles. But as we began to design it, and of course, there's always compromises that come with the design, we started to uh, eke away at that range. So the Joint Strike Fighter, the F-35 Charlie that flies from our carrier decks, actually only has a range that's just slightly longer than the F-18 Super Hornet, the, the ENF Super Hornet. So you can get about 500 to 600 nautical miles out of a joint strike fighter, 
uh, unrefueled, you can only get about 500 miles out of the F-18. So again, we're limited on being able to bridge that gap created by the Chinese with their stand off weapons. And it feels like the difficulty then is that these, given the lack of nautical range that you're referring to, it seems like this is all premised on us having an environment where we can have aerial refuelers available in the first place. And it doesn't seem like that, that that's very much an environment if it's you know, Iraq War 2003, that's the environment with the Houthis. That's definitely not the environment in a Asia Pacific conflict. Yeah, we can say right now, just based upon the performance of our our uh, our uh, air wings and our aircraft flying from the, the Ford previously and now with the Eisenhower in the Red Sea, is that our aircraft carriers perform exceptionally well in permissive air environments. If you're not really facing a threat and you can stand in close, and sortie generation, just the number of airplanes I can launch per day to kind of overwhelm uh, the land-based power that I'm up against. If, if you're in a permissive environment where you're facing really no significant threat, then those aircraft carriers are great. And in fact, we dominate the world. That's why we love our aircraft carriers and why we have 11 of them. However, if you're in a non-permissive environment, if you're in an anti-access air denied environment, and your most recent Gerald R. Ford class supercarrier cost between 13 and 15 billion dollars to operate or to build um, operate at 1.2 million dollars per day uh, and has some 5,000 American sailors on board, then you're going to be very hesitant to risk that in a non-permissive environment. So again, stepping back strategically, like you know rule number one in war is that that people die. Um, rule number two in war is never build an asset that, you cannot afford to lose. And that's what we've done with the Ford class is we have created an asset. First of all, the Ford costs almost two and a half times the amount of money that we spent on the previous Nimitz class aircraft carriers. Uh, the average Nimitz came in between five to $6 billion per copy. The last couple cost a little bit more because they were transitional carriers getting ready for the Fords. We incorporated new technologies in them. But the average Nimitz, because we built uh, 10 of them, uh, cost about five to six billion dollars. The Ford herself came in at twelve point nine, and by the way, that's not an accurate figure because the Ford was not complete when she was delivered. We used repair money to finish the Ford. The Kennedy is looks like she's going to come in again about the same price, greater than thirteen billion, and the Enterprise will have a high price tag as well. So we've created a new class of supercarrier that really can generate a lot of airplane sorties per day. Uh, but the fact is, is if you look at the anti-access air denied environment where you would expend the launch planes in the morning, have them fly away, be gone for long periods that day because they have to go great distances, sortie generation is not your metric of success. It's really because you're, you're only going to launch about 60 sorties a day, not the 150 sorties that you might in short range permissive environments. Um, so we sort of zigged in our carrier investment when the world zagged so far as how the world invested to counter our carriers. And we've, we've kind of found ourselves holding a gigantic bill in, sub, in, uh, in carrier technology uh, for what we've invested in vice what the world's environment is now demanding of us. Where does the, where do the dynamics run the carrier fit into the fact that um, for example, if there was a Taiwan conflict, almost certainly we're launching land-based uh, Air Force um, fighters, bombers, et cetera, from Japan. Um, they could maybe have the Marine Corps out in the Asia Pacific. You have F-35Bs, vertical takeoff and landing. Where does all of that fit together? It's not as if our entire strategy is we throw carriers into it, but oh no, we can't get them far enough. Like, where does What is the broad picture here? Well, so that you're getting at the major sort of uh, alliance question of the day, which is, you know, I know that Japan has come out and said that if China invades Taiwan, that Japan's in. They, they have made the statement that they would become involved in that. Uh, the question is, um, what is the secondary and tertiary effect of that? So, yes, we are planning on launching Air Force aircraft that would come from uh, U.S. bases in Japan. But that would also almost immediately make those bases targets. And those bases all lie well under China's ballistic missile threat envelope. So China could immediately begin saturating those bases with missiles to be able to interdict those fighters, catch them on the ground, take out our ordnance depots or our fuel farms and tanks. Uh, and that could happen very quickly. 
So there is a basic question about uh, whether Japan will remain in the fight for long after that. We are looking at five expeditionary bases that we're establishing in the Philippines right now. And under the the administration, the new Marcos administration in the Philippines, you know, we're making significant investments there. But again, that's five um, major bases there. Uh, we know where those are, and so do the Chinese. Those all also fall largely under uh, China's missile threat envelope. And then we have the problem of our aircraft carriers, uh, whether they could be able to launch an air wing uh, and be able to come to aid of Taiwan. The answer is probably not. The carrier is going to have to come into that threat wing, uh, ring. And at that point in time, they would be targeted. And we may have what we call a mission kill, which is having a missile hit the aircraft carrier, but not necessarily sink it, but destroy a large amount of its radars, its communications device, the aircraft that are still on deck. Uh, so what are we down to then? Well, now we're down to the Air Force and its long range strike potential. You know, we've got fewer than 20 B-2s. We've got a lot of B-52s that have some stand in long range attack missiles uh, that could be, you know, fly up to the threat ring and then launch against Chinese targets in, inside of it. The B-21 uh, is not come along yet in full capacity. They're just test flying it. So in this next couple of years, the B-21 isn't a factor. We are very limited in what we can do. Uh, what we can do is the submarine force. So we still have the four Ohio class SSGNs that have 150 Tomahawks each. Uh, I can't tell you how many would be at sea on any given day to be available to be able to you know, uh, strike against Chinese targets. And we have our Virginia class, our Seawolf class and our Los Angeles class submarines that have some Tomahawks and torpedoes on them to be able to sink Chinese shipping. Our, our target Chinese uh, land uh, installations. Those would probably be the most vital part of our response uh, to Taiwan is the submarine force. Um, the main question will be how many of those we will have in position um, on, on within the first seven days of any campaign. A lot of people, and I, I just let me make this point here about Please. the geography here. Um, a lot of people think, well, it's an ocean and we can get there fairly quickly. You cannot get from here to there quickly across the Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Ocean is vast, it's wide, it's deep. You can fit the moon into the Pacific Ocean without it touching Asia and North America. That's, that's how broad that is. It takes us on average about three weeks to get across the Pacific Ocean. So if China goes tomorrow, we're going to have to deal with what's in theater for the next few days. It's going to take us a couple of weeks to surge things from Pearl Harbor or even the West Coast of the United States to get to that theater. So, you know, this is the tyranny of distances. And something I think would be helpful to understand, because in non-expert spaces, I, I do a lot of work in the defense technology space, and everyone's very excited about drones and this idea that we've overinvested in these massive platforms. And the era of the drone um, has just really obliterated um, a lot of the opportunity there, making this akin to a World War II battleship type um, situation. But just, I'd love for you to like push back on me if this is incorrect. My pushback to folks who basically just sort of say, okay, we need to just replace this all with drones, just neglects, neglects A, the geography aspect. So it's like unclear to me like how these drones are delivered in the first place. Um, it's unclear how force power projection works. And then once again, I'm just kind of responding to general discourse I'm having, but I just love to be free to talk about how um, drone unmanned warfare fit into this dynamic. Because basically okay. every part of our conversation now could have happened in the mid 1990s. So let's take this to the 2020s then maybe. Well, uh, you know, and, and you're right. We could have, we were having these conversations about unmanned platforms in the 1990s. You know, we were using unmanned platforms uh, to help guide uh, uh, fire uh, control uh, from the battleships during Desert Storm. Uh, because we were launching pioneers off the bass, backs of our Iowa class battleships and then using them to spot, you know, for those big battleship guns. So we, we were starting to deal with, with drones then and we began to really think about it. However, there's always been a dynamic tension between the manned communities um, in the Army, the Air Force, and especially the Navy and the unmanned communities, because everyone has looked skeptically at the unmanned communities because they are a threat to manned missions, meaning, you know, the missions that the manned communities want to do, as well as the manned communities' budgets. And so there's been a natural compression on unmanned. Now, drones, when we talk about drones in, in terms of what we're seeing in Ukraine right now, where, where the drone is really sort of a revolutionary, revolutionizing war there, understand those are all local drones. 
you know, those are small helicopters that you and I could go down and, and purchase at the hobby shop. And then we put a hand grenade on it and we hover over a tank and we can drop it in the turret. And that's what the Ukrainians are doing. Really great, amazing stuff using off the shelf type capabilities. But there's no place uh, in the Western Pacific that you're going to take that off the shelf drone and launch it except from Taiwan or from Japan or from uh, the Philippines. And if you're launching for the Philippines, you're not going to make it to Taiwan. Uh, that range is just too great for most of the drone technology that we're seeing operate in Ukraine. Where we needed to be and where we passed up on a major opportunity is uh, we need uh, unmanned combat area vehicles. So in the early 2000s, mid, mid 20 teens, you know, the U.S. Navy invested in what we called UCAS-D, the Unmanned Combat Aerial System Demonstrator, which was the X-47B built by Northrop Grumman, which was an all-aspect stealth flying wing that had the ability to carry about uh, 2,000 pounds of ordnance, 1,500 nautical miles. We flew that thing out to an aircraft carrier. It landed by itself on the aircraft carrier using its own on uh, onboard system. It landed so accurately on the carrier that we had to alter the software on that to make it land in a different spot because it was gouging the same piece of metal out of the flight deck of the carrier. Mm -hmm. It was hitting so precisely. Um, then it took off from the carrier, it recovered from the carrier, it flew up, it hit the tanker, it, it refueled itself uh, in the air uh, by itself using its own autonomous system. And then we suddenly canceled those tests only about a third of the way through the test program because, and I'm, I'm convinced of this, is because we saw that as a threat to the manned community. Uh, that was where we could have been today is to have a long range, I'm talking 2,000 nautical miles, uh, all aspect stealth platform, meaning that no one's going to be able to see it. It would have been able to penetrate deep into anti-access air denial cap uh, environments, hit targets and return and find the carrier on the backside of it. But we sort of threw up uh, flack around that and we did not go there. We also need unmanned surface craft, and, and I would use those alongside um, manned surface craft like the new frigate. If I had unmanned sensor platforms that were shooting out, um, you know, low observable, uh, semi-submersible, operating just at the surface, below the surface with, with sensors on them to go out and extend my sensor range, and then even have unmanned platforms, again, semi-submersible, that go out that have a lot of ordnance on them so that I expand upon my ordnance uh, uh, magazine depth so that I'm using these unmanned platforms to weave together a picture of my environment in a very distributed fashion where I'm aggregating that picture back on a manned platform, perhaps outside the threat range, then firing off a weapon from a forward positioned unmanned platform and sort of orchestrating this, this, uh, this garage band of unmanned platforms out there, you know, and, and bringing it all together in an orchestrated fashion, that's where we could be today and where I've been actually advocating that we begin testing these concept of operations uh, to be able to bring all these things together. Unmanned underwater, uh, again, uh, sensor range uh, to be able to extend my awareness, have it dwell there so that I don't have to keep manned platforms in the area all the time, but I'm there, I'm listening, I'm building up that picture, I'm integrating that picture over time so that I know any changes going on. But we haven't made those investments, despite the fact that we've had the technology in place and we've had the knowledge of what we could be doing, we've chosen not to make those investments. So for these last two big questions, so I, I literally host a podcast called uh, The Arsenal of Democracy over at the Hudson Institute. So this is um, my favorite topic, especially what you're writing about in National Review. I want you to help me understand. I genuinely do not understand why at a narrative level, the Biden administration isn't doing a better job within the Arsenal of Democracy category, especially given the fact that you know, President Biden is making reference to the arsenal of democracy, but they're also clearly engaging in a foreign policy, Ukraine, the Middle East, Asia Pacific, that's going to necessitate us basically stepping up from where we are, from a replacement um, and force projection perspective. Um, the, the, the metaphor is there. It's like, I did FDR's thing. I did the CHIPS Act. I did the IRA. Now I'm focused on the arsenal of democracy. Like, wh what, what is happening? Because it's very frustrating um, to read the pieces that you're writing when it seems such an obvious political, unifying bipartisanship opportunity. I, I agree. I, I, I thought that this was an area, you know, something if we if we went from the CHIPS Act, something that Senator Schumer and Senator Young, Democrat and Republican, brought together to try and 
uh, uh, reshore um, microchip pro- uh, uh, fabs here into the United States to you know sort of shore up our independence from overseas suppliers of that. If we did something like a, a Ships Act, uh, where we decided to reshore industrial capacity, industrial production of shipbuilding here, back here in the United States. You know, right now, the largest shipbuilder in the world is China. Then you've got uh, South Korea, you've got Japan, you've got shipbuilders in Europe. We're sort of like number 17 on the list. Um, You know, we're way down there and we really don't have commercial shipbuilding. But there's other aspects of the industrial base that we don't have. I really thought that the Biden administration really missed a major opportunity in its first year, year and a half when it passed some of those major spending bills, uh, infrastructure investment bills. And they, they put essentially all of their chips into green energy, alternative energy type investments. That seems to be their political agenda. Their number one gen- uh, agenda is investing in, in sort of those types of priorities. Uh, perhaps that's because that's a priority of their party. But at the same time, you know, despite being the party of the industrial labor union, um, they sort of missed the opportunity to appeal to that, specifically in the Middle West where there's still a lot of industrial and manufacturing capacity in and around the Great Lakes or along the Mississippi and Ohio rivers, where you can still find that there is uh, excess capacity there for us to touch. So today, when we're trying to ramp up production of, of these missiles that we have been giving to Ukraine, or that we're now trying to ship aid to Israel, or we're trying to get uh, aid going to Taiwan, we need excess capacity there. You know, I wrote an essay in National Review uh, about a month, month and a half ago, where I talked about the fact at the end of the Cold War, you know, we took our industrial base from about 107 major defense manufacturers and we consolidated down to five, five major primes. We need to find a way of reversing that process and re-expanding or re-inflating that industrial base. So we build resiliency and redundancy. You know, We went through 30 years where resiliency and redundancy or redundancy was a bad word in our economy. We need to become more lean. We need to become more efficient. We need to single source our suppliers. You know, in in wartime, that just doesn't work. You actually need dual sources of suppliers. You want to make sure that if something goes wrong, if there's an attack or a terrorist attack against one main provider of a crucial element, that you have another one. You know, the Dwight Eisenhower actually had a policy that he called the dispersal policy. When we as a nation were getting our mind around the uh, the probability of a nuclear war, we wanted to make sure that there was at least two builders, if not three, of everything in the country. So Ike made it a policy to disperse the industrial base across the nation. Uh, when we built the first ICBM, the Atlas missile, which was built in Los Angeles, he said for the second ICBM, which was going to be Titan, Titan has to be built east of the Rockies. And so sure enough, it was built um, Colorado Springs, uh, east of the Rockies, because we wanted to make sure that we always had two suppliers of every major weapon system. I think your answer gets to the frustration I'm feeling, which is that everything you just said, domestic resiliency, pressures, you could fit this within the political project. You could say, hey, we lack a resilient infrastructure system. Hey, we let the market take over the semiconductor piece, and now we're dependent on vulnerable um, Taiwanese chips. We're then, then going to extend that logic into the defense industrial base. It just seems that there just isn't a coalition. There just isn't a political coalition that would take the Biden administration's explicit policy to its logical conclusion. If you're going to be an isolationist and say, look, we don't care about the Middle East, we don't care about Europe, we don't care about the Asian Pacific, you don't need to worry about the arsenal of democracy as much. But if you are going to say this is your thing, I wish that they would take that policy to its logical conclusion um, and focus on like the Ships Act, um, which isn't an actual act, but the, the idea you're you're speaking about here. Because there's a huge, I think there's a huge political opportunity there um, that wasn't taken. I agree. And, and again, um, you know, I, I always joke that I'm an, I'm an Eisenhower Republican. Um, the other part of that means I'm a Republican who will raise your taxes. Uh, but <laughs> my, my point here is I want to find the vital center, create pragmatic solutions, find places where we can have mutual agreement, left, right, and center, and rebuild that vital center in our national dialogue, especially around national security. Uh, which I think is a place that we, you know, providing for the common defense should be something that we can all agree upon. And so how do we get there? Um, I've actually had positive response uh, from uh, Republican and Democrat senators, Republican and Democrat members of the House on the idea of a SHIPS Act. 
So I'd love to be able to take that and move forward. But you are absolutely correct. Until the administration in the White House picks up the gauntlet, we're, we're not going to be able to really move forward on Capitol Hill. We, there's only so much that individual senators or even senators working in a bipartisan fashion can bring that to bear. And right now, we just haven't seen that attention from the White House on the industrial base, uh, specifically on the industrial and manufacturing part of that base. If we were talking about coding and microchips, yeah, that's one thing. But I'm talking about steel workers. I'm talking about metal mm -hmm. fabrication, electricians, welders. That's an area where we need the attention of the administration as well. So last question here in to provide and maintain, you have this really great, uh, it's towards the end of the book, discoursing on the difference between a land power and a sea power. And the key thing about World War II and then the challenges of the Cold War is that the United States both had to slash was able to opt to be a land power and a sea power um, at once during the post Cold War era before great power competition. We also were able to kind of continue on that legacy. It seems clear from reading your work, though, that we're increasingly in a period where the United States has to behave much more like a sea power. Talk about what those terms mean, land versus sea, and what the implications are. That's how we'll close out the episode. Well, it's, it's a great question. Thank you for allowing me to sort of close on that. Uh, when we were founded as a nation, we were very much founded as a sea power. That's why the Constitution actually says to provide and maintain a Navy, while, where when we talk about the Army, it was to uh, raise and support the Army. Uh, so the Army was viewed as an episodic aspect of the national life, where the Navy was a permanent aspect of, the, of life. And that's because we were 13 colonies on the Atlantic seaboard, really looking at European markets both to sell our goods and then to buy finished goods from them. So we were very much a sea power at that time. As we started to move across the continent, um, settling the continent uh, you know, with our, our uh, settlers and, and bringing states into the union, um, we sort of became focused on the land challenge of the continent. So we became continentalist, uh, very much like a France or a Germany, focused on the middle territory, what it takes to sort of control this. Then when we reached the other coast, it's really kind of interesting that Alfred Thayer Mahan, uh, the great uh, maritime strategist uh, from the United States, does not emerge until the continent is settled. Um, in the late, uh, the early 1990s. And then Mahan emerges as we began to look outward again across the two oceans, now the Atlantic and the Pacific, and thinking about global trade and where we're going to go with these finished goods that are being created in the American economy. And so we began in the 20th century because we were large, vibrant, powerful, had a, the world's largest economy and continue to grow. We could afford to be both a continental power and a sea power simultaneously. In fact, we're, we're really the only nation in, in global history who could be both. And so we were essentially right up until the end of the Cold War uh, because we had a large thriving economy and we had technological change. We were able to maintain strategic advantage. The problem that we have is since the end of the Cold War, one, we've allowed our military power, both land uh, and sea, to atrophy. The second is that we've raced, uh, uh, seen rising imbalances in our economy. So right now, $34 trillion in debt, um, and with rising interest rates, you know, the servicing on that debt becomes a challenge. We can no longer afford to be all things to all people. We've seen this in our dialogue where there's sort of these neo-isolationist voices that are beginning to rise up, uh, asking us to come home and focus on challenges here at home that we can no longer afford to be everywhere. And perhaps we can't. But we also cannot afford to turn our back on the world. We have uh, 50 treaty allies, 49 of which fly across oceans. And so my argument is, is now is the time to refocus on what is there in our founding DNA, the sea power aspect of our foreign policy. And do we take a, uh, a decided navalist maritime approach to the world, understanding that our role in any future exchange was to ensure the free flow of goods and supplies to our allies and partners as they fight their wars, utilizing their own organic forces, where we provide them with naval and air power support, and perhaps the support of our space force and our overhead intelligence assets to provide them with awareness of what's going on in their environment. But that we dominate the commons of the, of the planet, the sea, air, and space, and cyberspace, and we lend our support to them on their local actions um, from those commons whereas we ask them to take up their own self-defense with their land forces. So that's the navalist sea power approach to the world that I think that we can afford to do and that we must do. Very well said. Jerry, thank you for joining me on The Realignment. Lots of great links to all of your work are available for folks in the show notes. Thanks for joining me on the show.
Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here.